always on the go, but the day just won't be one without your Hollywood fix. Let Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast take care of that. An all-inclusive look of pop culture. Greetings, good people of the planet Earth and the known universe. You're listening to GSMC's Entertainment Podcast. It's your Captain Keith. And it's always good to be back. Good people of the planet Earth and the known universe. Entertainment, entertainment, entertainment news. Oh, man, I got some news for you today. <laughs> it's been a busy week already, and it's just Wednesday. Good people of the planet Earth and the universe, known universe. It's just Wednesday. We're just, you know, we're like, well, it's hump day. We're like midway through. It's crazy. <laughs> Today's podcast episode is entitled Kamora Simmons Brawl. Beeb supports Chris Brown and Badu Backlash. <sighs> oh, yeah. Let's get it. So, starting off the news today, entertainment. Pregnant Carrie Underwood and husband Mike Fisher adopt a new puppy. Isn't that nice? Nice picture of the two of the, uh, the, of the handsome couple. Uh, yeah, at the ABC's uh, CMA Awards. Yeah, they're a nice couple. Nice looking. Welcome to the family. There's a new member in Carrie Underwood's family, and no, it's not her baby. The Love Wind singer's husband, Mike Fisher, took to Instagram earlier this week to announce that they adopted a, an adorable puppy. Meet the newest member of our family, Isaiah, affectionately named him Zero. I don't know why your kid would name a dog Zero, but okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess it fits because it's the chance of surviving if you try to break into our home. Then he's got a laughing emoji. Hashtag GSD. The Nashville Predators hockey player wrote alongside the sweet snap of their new canine companion, explained that the couple's son, Isaiah Three, was the one that named their new pal Zero. Joins Underwood and Fisher's two other dogs, Ace and Penny. See, I, I, I like those names. Ace and Penny. Zero, not so much, but hey, what do I know? Underwood, 35, is currently pregnant with a couple's second child. The country superstar announced that she was expecting a bundle of joy in August. You might be wondering or asking, Carrie, why is your tour starting in May? Well, yay, she wrote, revealing that she was pregnant. Mike and Isaiah and I are absolutely over the moon and excited to be adding another little fish to our pond. That's cute. Underwood has been sharing sweet pregnancy updates with her fans, even revealing that she was, was expecting another boy while hosting the 2018 CMA Awards. She's also been vocal about the three miscarriages she suffered in the last two years. 2017 just wasn't how I imagined it. I kind of planned that 2017 was you know, going to be the year that I work on new music and I have a baby. We got pregnant early 2017 and, and didn't work. It didn't work out. And she revealed during September's interview uh, with CBS on the Sunday morning show. Underwood went on to explain that at this point she worked to appreciate that some things are out of her hands despite the painful circumstances. That's true. And that's, that's not easy to, to, to um, acknowledge for, for, for any of us sometimes, you know. So she also stated, uh, let's see. In 2018, at the Grammy, excuse me, in 2018, at the CMT uh, Artist of the Year event in October, where she shared her second pregnancy, you know, she said it has been a lot different than at first. When they say every pregnancy is different, it really is. She said, just different symptoms. Symptoms. I feel like this one is just a little harder on my body for some reason, but it's been really good. I'm squeezing myself into whatever dresses I can squeeze myself into, she added uh, to, her maternity, to her maternity style. That's cute. Alyssa Milano calls red MAGA hats the new white hood, and Sarah Palin responds. Yes, people of the planet Earth, like I said, it, it was on a crack in this week. <laughs> it was on a crack in this week. <laughs> Entertainers let it fly. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So Alyssa Milano and Sarah Palin are in the middle of a heated war of words. It all started when the Charmed alum shared her thoughts on Donald Trump's instantly recognizable Make America Great Again campaign hats after news broke that a number of Catholic teens from Kentucky were caught allegedly harassing an elderly Native American during a trip to Washington, D.C. last week. The red MAGA hat 
is the new white hood. Uh, she quote unquote, or end quote. She wrote implying that the Trump supporting hat has replaced the robes of the KKK without white boys being able to empathize uh, with other people. Humanity will continue to destroy itself. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I've just, I just don't even know what to say. Um, <laughs> I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> Alyssa Milano was very full of surprises. Uh, very full. Uh, she she got me good today. Okay. All right, Miss Milano. I, I see you. I see you. The next day, she followed that up by commenting on the reason the aforementioned teens were in the nation's capital. An anti-abortion rally, which crossed paths with an indigenous people's march where the standoff took place. And you're like, wow, Really? So 2019, we're still protesting uh, abortion. Okay. All right. Didn't know that was still happening. Silly me. <laughs> Let's not forget, this entire event happened because a group of boys went on a school-sanctioned trip to, pro to protest against a woman's right to her own body and reproductive health care, she wrote. It is not debatable that bigotry was at play from the start. Ouch. On Monday, the former vice presidential candidate Push back at Milano's claims. Well, there you go again, Alyssa. Palin captioned a pair of photos showcasing her and her son Trig, who has Down syndrome, comparing MAGA apparel with white hoods, imitating that anyone who wore, who's worn MAGA has no love for minorities or other people who don't look like you or your perfect child. How dare you? Alyssa, did you not know white hoods represented hatred for minorities and handicapped children and adults whom the hooded KKK and white supremacists deemed unworthy of life? She continued, remember some Democrat leaders of old, like Senator Robert Byrd, embracing all that as, as a part of their disgusting KKK association? Palin concluded by reminding the actress that MAGA hats aren't merely worn by white individuals. So, and this is true. So from your warped Hollywood perch, are you including MAGA wearing moms of Native American and different children in your intolerant, prejudiced, gag-inducing rhetoric? <laughs> but Milano isn't taking the criticism she's received from Palin or anyone else online lying down. Late Tuesday afternoon, she teased that she's writing an op-ed where she will further discuss the issue. Apparently, I'm in hot water and facing backlash. <laughs> Quote, she captioned a retweet of ABC's Seven's coverage of her statement regarding the MAGA hats. So I'm going to do what any thoughtful human with a platform would do. Write an op-ed. Stay tuned. The pair at the center of the D.C. standoff was Covington Catholic High School junior Nick Salmon, who was wearing a MAGA hat, and Omaha Nation elder Nathan Phillips. Phillips is shown banging a drum and singing while Salmon just stares and smirks in the videos from the scene. Afterward, Phillips claimed to have stepped into the middle of a heated situation in an attempt to diffuse attention between the two rallies. Instead, he found himself the object of intense ridicule. When I was there, I was standing there, and I seen that the group of people in front of me, I seen the angry faces and all of that. I realized I had put myself in a really dangerous situation, he told CNN. Here's a group of people who were angry at somebody else, and I put myself in front of that. And all of a sudden, I'm the one who's all that anger who's all that anger and all that, that wanting to have the freedom to just rip me apart. That was scary. So Native Americans are protesting and they look angry. That's a shocker. Okay. <laughs> they were looking for trouble, looking for something. He later added, seriously, really? We're, we're, we're going to go there. Okay. Everybody knows the right to life and pro-choice. It's been like this, and they're hateful to each other. And it's because I'm a veteran. I'm a Vietnam veteran. And that these two groups even have the right in, in this country to have protests, to have compl conflicting opinions. He, he is right about that. Wow. And in more entertainment news, fans pay tribute on the 11th anniversary of Heath Ledger's death. 11 years he's been gone. It's sad. Great actor. Rest in peace, Heath. This morning, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science and Sciences released the list of nominations for the annual awards, the Oscars. Today is the 11th anniversary of Heath Ledger's death in 2008, a year before his a year before uh, his win for Best Supporting Actor as the Joker in The Dark Knight. And I believe that's the first posthumous uh, Academy Award winner release. 
or Academy, Academy Award winning. Um, his turn as the Joker, which may cite as the undoing of Ledger, the role that pushed him over the edge after years in the spotlight, has gone as, has gone down as iconic. Although for some reason, Jared Leto and Joaquin Phoenix are still trying to play the same character. <laughs> when he won the posthumous Oscar for the role back in 2009, his parents and his sister went up to accept it for, for him and delivered a concise speech. This role and many others of Ledger's like Ennis Del Mar and Brokeback Mountain or his interpretation of Bob Dylan and I'm Not There have been shouted out by fans all over the internet today. Right on. And his Joker role was the like the best ever. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was amazing. He killed it. Yeah, and he is definitely missed. I had no idea that he was going to come with that role the way that he did. And I was like, wow. Yeah. And in more entertainment news, Willow Smith and Kendall Jenner are the new faces for Stuart Weitzman's spring campaign. Very nice picture of Willow Smith. She's growing up there. <laughs> she looks adorable. Uh, as well as model Yang Mi and Jean Campbell, we know that Kendall Jenner and Jaden Smith probably call each other friends, but now it seems like Kendall and Willow Smith are now work friends. Kendall, Willow, along with Yang Mi, or, or my, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, and Jean Campbell are the new faces of Stuart Weitzman's 2019 spring campaign. The popular shoe brand has debuted the first campaign that sees all four models posted in a new setting with famous heels strapped tight. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. The campaign is going back to its original ethos by creating designs that meld fashion, function, and fit, and shoes that make a woman feel better, excuse me, make a woman feel beautiful on her own terms. Right on, okay. Willow has been laying pretty low lately, only hosting Facebook's Red Table Talk with her mom, so it's nice to see her making her own moves. Growing up and trying to figure out your life while people feel like they have some sort of entitlement to know what's going on is, abs is absolutely excruciatingly, excruciatingly terrible. Willow previously told uh, Girl Gaze. The only way to get over it is to go into it. You can't change your face. You can't change your parents. When you're born into it, there are two choices that you have. I'm either going to try and go into it completely, go into it completely and help from the inside, or no one is going to know where I am. And I'm really going to take myself completely out of the eye of society. There's really no in between. Okay. Well, congratulations on the campaign. I'm sure all of you would do well. Taraji P. Henson gets dragged for comparing R. Kelly to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> nice picture of, of Taraji, though, um, at a Fox press event. Taraji P. Henson attempted to have a woke moment on social media, which undoubtedly backfired in her face. The actress faced backlash after she tried to compare the public's treatment of R. Kelly and Harvey Weinstein but was quickly reminded that the point went over her head completely. Taraji P. Henson shared several since deleted posts on her Instagram story, comparing the hashtag mute R. Kelly hashtag to the hashtag mute Harvey Weinstein hashtag. Many quickly reminded Henson that R. Kelly is a musician that's making it feasible to mute him while Weinstein is a film executive who sits behind the scenes. However, many also revealed that Weinstein is actually facing charges for his alleged sex crimes while Kells only has, ha has a hashtag so far. That is true. He is facing charges, but he has not been convicted yet. The only one who's been convicted is Bill Cosby. So, Mr. Weinstein's facing charges and so is Kevin Spacey. It is yet to, it has remained to be seen if they will be convicted. So far, Bill Cosby's in jail. Nobody else is. So we'll see what's going on with that. So I'm still, we're all still watching to see how this is all going to play out. To be fair, Henson took to Twitter to shortly after facing backlash for a post. Let me be clear. R. Kelly, <laughs> she put in caps. Let me be clear. R. Kelly is guilty and wrong and should be muted, period. She wrote. <laughs> exclamation mark, exclamation mark, yes. right on. Henson undoubtedly received an overwhelming amount of backlash for the post, but there were a few others who were a bit more empathetic to the point she was trying to make. One person pointed out that Henson is an actress in the film industry and, it, and, the, and the impact of Weinstein's or Weinstein's actions have more of an impact on her than R. Kelly. And that is true. Henson's comments 
faced similar backlash to those of Erica Badu, who appeared to have defended kills at a concert in Chicago. Badu later took to Twitter to clarify her tweets, which also faced public scrutiny. I love you unconditionally, she says. That doesn't mean I support your poor choices. I want healing for you and anyone you have hurt as a result of you being hurt, she wrote. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> no one wants to hear that you love R. Kelly right now. Just just keeping it real. No one wants to hear that. Not at all. Just saying. <laughs> oh, man. Social media is the equalizer. Good people of the planet Earth and the known universe. If you did not know, social media is the equalizer. <laughs> it giveth and it taketh away. Like a great Queens of Stone Age song. Oh, yes. I, I digress. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, man, oh, where are we? Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I got all into that. All right. Oh, so yes, people. The parking lot brawl. I mean, who knew? Well, you know what? We'll get into that after this break. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. And once again, you're listening to Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast. It's your Captain Keith speaking. Yes, Kamora Lee Simmons brawl. Oh, as I call it, Kamora Lee Simmons gets in parking lot altercation. Cops called. And here's the report. Oh, my. While we assume that Kamora Lee Simmons' recent errand run in Los Angeles had no ill intentions, <laughs> unfortunately, new reports detail how to how a stop off at FedEx turned into a full on parking lot brawl. <laughs> wow. Um, it's reported that the designer model mogul, who was the founder of baby fat and mom got into an argument with another woman over a parking spot that led to them getting physical and shoving each other. Oh my. According to the publication, Kamora took off and the other unidentified woman called the cops and filed a battery charge while Kamora called cops once she arrives home with similar charges. The cops are investigating the situation and apparently looking to acquire surveillance footage from the parking lot. Wow. Drama people. Drama. Nothing really bothers me when it comes to things like that, Kamara previously stated about the rumors about herself in the media. I mean, I think it's fair game and probably I do have a thicker skin. Sometimes it's so crazy what's being said. So I try to ignore it as much as I can and keep you know, you have your own business to be worried about, not someone else misreporting things or saying things about you. I think we can all rise above it as it's all sport and fun. And for somebody to make a buck, if you try and take it and stride, I think it'll be okay. It comes with the territory. So when we find out more about what happened, I'll let you know. That's just very interesting. I just never thought I'd be reporting that story today. <laughs> And in more entertainment news, <laughs> Justin Bieber and Haley Baldwin once again postponed their wedding. This is a picture of both of them and Justin's looking down, looking like he's kind of high. I don't know what he's looking at in this picture. I love how these publications find the most crazy pictures of celebrities. I don't know how they do it. I don't know if they have them on reserve or what. And just pull them out to fit with their article. It cracks me up. Um, He's just looking down at something, though. I, I, maybe he's surprised at something. I don't know what it is, but it's interesting. 
And then Haley's looking off to the to the right, like she's just kind of not there. This could be just a bad picture day. Who knows? Anyway, let's get to the story. Justin Bieber and his wife, who now goes by Haley Bieber, have once again postponed their wedding. They've had one already back in November, but they are celebrities and and thus they must keep up appearances and have a public Kate and William style wedding. Wouldn't it be great to get a (laughs) a commemorative Justin and Haley's wedding tent of English breakfast tea? Oh, that's in my nose. That's funny. I like that. Okay. All right. Okay. That would be interesting. I'd love to see what it would look like. That could be a, a collector's edition, actually. Yeah, it could be. That could be worth some money one day. They were originally planned to have the ceremony in the beginning of March, but according to TMZ, too many loved ones wouldn't be able to make it that week, the week of Mr. Bieber's birthday. So they set out a second note after they'd already sent a save the date for three to 300 people saying that they would reschedule. These loved ones could be anyone from Bieber's mom, who's got to come all the way from Stratford, Ontario, home of the Stratford Shakespeare Festival, to Kylie Jenner and Travis Scott, another celebrity elite couple. Other prospective guests apparently include Chris Brown, despite the current controversy he's he's embroiled in, as well as Drake, and for some reason, Odell Beckham Jr. The new wedding doesn't have yet The new wedding doesn't have yet to have a date. Okay. So we'll see about that. Why they got to hate on Odell Beckham Jr.? There's nothing wrong with him and Peeps being friends. If they're friends, they're friends. You know, it is what it is. (laughs) Pete Davidson says R. Kelly should be shot in the effing face. All right. There's a picture of him uh, looking into the camera, and he's got, looks like a... Oh, something questionable in this mouth that he's smoking. So, <laughs> might be marijuana. I'm not quite sure. Oh well. Comedians take a difficult task of addressing social issues in popular culture with humor, regardless of whether the subjects they engage with are inherently funny to the general public. Pete Davidson has been criticized for missing the mark with some of his stand-up routines and Saturday Night Live punchlines. Yeah, screw it in to get comfortable with this one. Uh, all right. But the 25 year old actor continues along his path despite any hurdles placed before him. On Monday, Davidson took on R. Kelly, according to Us Weekly. During his performance at the Bell House, the entertainer began with his usual self deprecation. I thought I was having a bad year. He related his plight to that of R. Kelly, who was dealing with sexual assault allegations, both resurfaced and new. Man, that guy is evil, he said, before adding that the R&B singer should get shot in the effing face. This comment would make Pete yet another celebrity who opposed R. Kelly. Though most of these critics usually do not express their opinions with violence. His set also included one of his seemingly favorite topics. Davidson mused about his ex fiance Ariana Grande, in relation to the size of his genitalia. Ariana is a tiny lady, so everything to her is huge. He said, every girl for the rest of my life who sees my penis will be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You keep using that shtick, bro. You keep use, you keep saying that line, but whatever, man. <laughs> You're trying to get people to think, no, no, it's not true. Okay. <laughs> that just makes it seem like it's even more true. Yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of brilliant yourself there, Mr. Davidson. You're kind of brilliant yourself in what you're doing there. I see what you're doing. <laughs> and more entertainment news. I mean, we haven't had Keeping Up With Kanye. I guess this month is Keeping Up With R. Kelly. <laughs> R. Kelly banned from visiting studio as frequently following docuseries. Okay. New reports from page six detail how R. Kelly's recording studio is no longer his go-to spot after the scrutiny it received in the Surviving R. Kelly documentary. The warehouse location was allegedly not just a studio, but rather a place the disgraced singer would take young women. It looks like people are living there, and that's not good. Cook County Judge Patrice Ball Reed said. According to the publication, the judge reviewed photos of the warehouse that showed faulty stairs, crumbling walls, and fire hazards, which means R. Kelly can only use the property for work purposes between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., 
The ignition singer is not allowed to use the second floor of the warehouse since it's been labeled as dangerous. Mm-mm-mm. This is probably the city needs. This is a pro- excuse me. This is a problem the city needs to address quickly. City attorney Greg James said in a complaint filed Tuesday, we believe it's a, it's imminently dangerous. Residents who live near the studio have detailed how they've been witness to some of the, the guests R. Kelly would bring to the studio. I've seen younger girls in front of the building, back of the building. Jim Lewis, who works nearby, told the publication. After his last incident about a year ago, he did a little spring cleaning. There were mattresses in the alley, boxes of women's shoes. Oh, man, this guy. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Mm. And in more entertainment news, Erica Badu, Badu Backlash, here we go. Erica Badu denies knowing, denies knowing R. Kelly personally, demands apology. <laughs> it's a nice picture of Erica on stage. Badu clashes with surviving R. Kelly producer, Dream Hampton, in a heated Twitter de- uh, debacle. Since clarifying her stance on the now infamous R. Kelly prayer, Erica Badu has been embroiled in a heated Twitter spat with Dream Hampton, the director of Lifetime Surviving R. Kelly docuseries earlier in the month. When Hampton was in the midst of a press run, uh, she named Erica Badu as one of the notable public figures refusing to, to participate in the project. In the wake of her frosty reception at the hands of a Chicago crowd, visibly displeased with her R. Kelly prayer, uh-huh. <laughs> Badu has finally taken to addressing Hampton's allegations of noncompliance. In fact, it was the director himself uh, it was the director herself taking to the fight to her doorstep. Okay. Hampton demanded Badu answer two questions, short of forcing an apology. She didn't seem at all willing to provide. One, quote, a quote attributed to her, no one has done more for black people than R. Kelly. And number two, what she was thinking when she called him her brother at Soul Train Awards. Hampton listed in, in order they saw fit. In turn, Badu demanded an apology from Hampton for committing libel and for using her name with no ordinance. In all, Erica Badu denied ever being contacted to participate in the docuseries and most surprisingly not knowing R. Kelly at all. On a personal level, despite calling him brother during the aforementioned concert spiel, when Dream Hampton tried to convince Badu of her error in judgment, the conversation devolved into an impasse with the director altogether refusing to with the director altogether refusing to provide textual evidence that producer T. Ferris had made an overture to the singer. But now here's the thing though. Erica Badu is a very famous celebrity. Um, so this is probably gonna there's always gonna be people trying to reach out to your people that you may not even know about. So it's very possible that they reached out to your people and, and they said no and even and never even told you about it or told you about it later. Or it's possible that it never or that it didn't happen. And that's a fifty fifty. So it could be that it didn't happen, but it could be that it did happen and you didn't know about it or you knew about it. We don't really know. But when you are a celebrity of her stature, you have people and they have people. And sometimes, you know, when people speak on your behalf, you don't always know they're doing that. And that's when things can get really messy. So just to Captain Keith's perspective there. So, R. Kelly faces heavy fines after Chicago studio hit with 66 billion violations. Report. Yeah, so I guess we're keeping up with R. Kelly today. <laughs> mm. R. Kelly isn't facing any charges over the alleged sex crimes he's accused of, but he might have to cough up a lot of cash over building violations. R. Kelly's stress levels must be through the roof these days. <laughs> He not only is he facing major backlash for the allegations of sexual abuse against him that were discussed in Surviving R. Kelly, but the Chicago studio that was featured heavily in the docuseries was recently subjected to a search by Chicago authorities. After finding evidence of residency in the industrial warehouse, officials are coming for the singer over a lengthy list of building violations. So we, we did report last week that his, his studio had been inspected. Uh, in regards to whether or not there's proof of residency. So this is literally the follow-up to that report from last week. Um, Kell's Chicago studio was hit with 66 building violations, predominantly due to the use of the space as a residence and not having proper permits to build a sauce, a sauce bar, and steam room. Court documents reveal that the fines range from $500 to 1000 
for each of the violations go without being addressed. Kells is facing a fine that could be anywhere between 33000 and 63000 per day. That's a lot of money. Mm. Kels was already ordered to take out all of his permanent items from the building. However, he is allowed to use his space to record music from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The studio was sworn by Chicago officials and police last week for complaints that the place was being used as a residency. Sources claim that R. Kelly denied that the studio was ever used as a living space and says the space is, is exactly how it was when he began renting it. Kells' lawyer claims the judge sided with the singer despite the violations and rejected the city's attempt to shut down the building entirely. His legal team argued that the issues with the studio weren't deemed an emergency. Therefore, they were ordered to remove personal items. Ah, well, there that is. More entertainment news after this break. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. And once again, you're listening to Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast. This is your Captain Keith. Brian Singer responds to multiple new sexual mis misconduct allegations. Uh, okay. Let's, <laughs> let's see what it says here. Brian Singer is facing new allegations from four men that he either molested or had sex with them when they were teenagers in the late 1990s. Oh, man. In a new report by The Atlantic, the, the men talk about their allegations in detail, three of them asking for the identities to be concealed for privacy and fear of retaliation. The Atlantic says they've talked with more than 50 sources and identified certain details of their stories independently during a year-long investigation. Singer has never been charged with a crime. In addition, his lawyer notes to the outlet that Singer categorically denies ever having sex with or a preference for underage men. In a statement to ET on Wednesday, Singer called the new report a homophobic smear piece. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, folks. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Marketing is uh, is something else, isn't it? Yeah. So, so the last time I posted about this subject, Esquire magazine was pre preparing to publish an article written by a homophobic journalist who has a bizarre obsession with me dating back to 1997, the statement reads, after careful fact-checking and in consideration of the lack of credible sources, Esquire chose not to publish this piece of, uh, of vendetta journalism. That didn't stop this writer from selling, to, selling it to the Atlantic. It's sad that the Atlantic would stoop to this low level of journalistic integrity. Again, I am forced to reiterate that this story rehashes claims from bogus lawsuits filed by a disreputable cast of individuals willing to lie for money and attention. And it is no surprise that with Bohemian Rhapsody being an award-winning hit, this homophobic smear piece has been conv conventionally time to take advantage of its success. Meanwhile, the four men accusing Singer of sexual misconduct say the aftermath of their alleged incidents with the director negatively affected their lives, in some cases leading to drug abuse, anxiety, and depression. One accuser, Victor Valavino says he and Singer crossed paths in 1997 when he was in the seventh grade and Singer's movie At Pupil was filming at his middle school in Altadena, California. 
He claims he first met Singer when he ran to him in the, in the bathroom. And Singer, who was then in his early 30s, allegedly told him he was so good looking and invited him to be in the film. Valda Venus, who was then 13, alleges that when he later showed up on set, he was asked to disrobe completely except for a towel around his waist. He alleges Singer directed him to, to a back room and he was instructed to wait. And when he came back, Singer molested him. How did it all? He did it all with this smile, Valda Venus alleges. I was frozen, speechless. He came back to where I was in the locker room throughout the day to molest me. It was embarrassing, he continues. I didn't want anyone to know, so I locked it away. Valdivino says he eventually tried to contact an attorney to file a civil suit and file a complaint with the California Attorney General's office. He says he was directed to go to the police, but that both attorneys and police told him too much time had passed. Through his attorney, Singer told The Atlantic that he doesn't know who Valdivino is and denied that anything had happened between them. Another accuser then alleges he met Singer when he was 16 and had oral sex with him when he was 17, it was either 17 or 18. He alleges he was passed around among other men in Singer's social circle. He would stick his hands down your pants without your consent, Ben alleges of Singer's behavior. He was predatory in that he would ply people with alcohol and drugs and then have sex with them. The third accuser, Andy, alleges he first had sex with Singer when he was 15 and that Singer knew his age after being introduced to him by now defunct digital entertainment network, DEN founding CEO, Mark Collins, rector. Singer would have been 31 at the time. Andy claims that the late Brad Renfro, who starred in 1998's At Pupil and died of an overdose in 2008 at the age of 25, was in the room with him and Singer, but didn't join in. Oh, I don't think Brad was gay or even bi, Andy says in Renfro. I think he was going with the flow. We talked about it. Like me, he looked around at all the things these guys had, all the money. Maybe he thought the guys were going to do things for him. In 2000, the federal grand jury indicted Collins Rector, whom Andy also claims he had sex with when he was 14 years old before being introduced to Singer on charges related to transporting a minor across the state lines for the purpose of sex. After fleeing to Spain for two years, Collins Rector ultimately pled guilty to nine charges of transporting minor, transporting a minor across state lines for the purpose of sex and was sentenced to nine years in prison. The fourth accuser, Eric, claims he had begun having sex with Singer when he was 17 and Singer was 31. He also alleges he had sexual relations with multiple men in the, in the director's circle. If you weren't young and cute enough to be their boy, you could still ingratiate yourself by bringing boys to them, Eric claims. That's how I met Brian, and that's how I, would, that's how I wound up at the DEN estate, people trying to ingratiate themselves. I never want people to think of me as a victim. Where was I? So I was always put up... So I always put up the front of I'm good. I was in charge. He continues to he continues of how the alleged abuse has affected him. But I spent a decade in therapy trying to figure out if what happened was bad or not bad. And if it was bad, was it my fault? What I've decided is that the adults are supposed to look out for kids. This isn't the first time Singer has faced accusations of having sex with underage boys. In 2014, Michael F. Egan III sued Singer, alleging that Singer had raped him several times in 1999 when Egan was 17. Singer called Egan's claims outrageous, vicious, and completely false. At the time, in a statement, um, and the case was later dropped after several inconsistencies were found in Egan's story. The Atlantic also spoke to Cesar Sanchez Guzman, who sued Singer in, in December 2017, alleging that Singer raped him on a yacht in 2003 when he was 17. The case is still pending, and Sanchez Guzman says he is frustrated with how slow it's moving. He also says he wasn't surprised that Singer's Bohemian Rhapsody, his film that he was eventually fired from in December 2017, won Best Drama at the Golden Globes earlier this month. 
The industry will brush things under the rug and pretend nothing happened, Sanchez Guzman says. Most people don't see the truth. Huh. All right. Gina Rodriguez breaks down crying when responding to critics calling her anti-black. And this is Gina Rodriguez of the Jane the Virgin fame. Gina Rodriguez is speaking out following allegations that she's anti-black. The 34-year-old Jane the Virgin actress recently appeared on radio show Sway in the morning and defended herself against recent claims that she's anti-black. The backlash began with the November 2018 Net a Porter Roundtable, excuse me, Net a Porter Roundtable, with Rodriguez, where she said that black women are paid more than Latino women. The scrutiny intensified after Rodriguez took to Twitter to ask, Marvel and DC are killing it in inclusion and women, but where are the Latinos? Asking for a friend. That tweet caused many to ask why Rodriguez was questioning a groundbreaking, a groundbreaking movie like Black Panther and point out that Afro Latino actress, including Actresses, including Tessa Thompson and Zoe Saldana, Zoe Saldana, appear in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's just two people. Um, I wasn't speaking about my industry, she said of the Netta Porter Roundtable, which also included Ellen Pompeo, Emma Roberts, and Gabrielle Union. Uh, and I saw that interview. It was a good interview. I always find it difficult to talk about equal pay as a woman who makes a substantial amount of money. As someone who came from poverty to now the amount of money that I get paid, it doesn't feel right when I'm the one talking about it because I'm just so damn grateful. To then be on the panel with women that I respect and admire and for us to talk about a subject that I find very difficult to talk about. What I was saying was that when we talk about equal pay, we have to talk about inter intersectionality because we all must rise. Rodriguez went on to emotionally call the backlash devastating that, that made for a really dark time, largely due to her connection to the black community. The black community was the only community that I looked towards growing up. We didn't have many Latino shows, and the black community made me feel like I was seen, she said through tears. So to get anti-black is saying that I'm anti-family. My father is dark-skinned. He's Afro-Latino, and my cousins are, and, and, my, and my cousins are. And Puerto Ricans are African, Tayano and Spaniard, and it's in blood. It's in the, so that was really devastating to me. If anything, the black community is my community. As Latinos, we have black Latinos. That is what we are, she added. I am not. So I think when I speak about Latino advocacy, people believe I only mean people of my skin color. And little do they know that I'm very aware of what my culture is and that the op and, and the and the opportunities I create and who I put in those spaces are both the Latino and black community and the black community. All right. The, 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 the oh, excuse me, the uh, annihilation star continued telling the host that the last thing I want to do is put two underrepresented groups against each other. Our unification is what our is what is our rise. Our unification is what's going to allow both our communities to continue to flourish. That really effing hard, that really effing hard period was intensified because Rodriguez didn't know how to defend her words and explain what she meant. What do you say? Sorry for cheating when you didn't cheat? How do you talk to a bunch of people that all they do is read? Gina Rodriguez says controversial comments about black actresses. When, 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 whatever, why? Never in a million years, she said. So that crap was real difficult. But I have to keep my head up and, and know my heart and know what I do and know who I am. How do you talk to so many people and let them know that, like, oh, you are so far from the truth? Like, that is so far from my heart. That is so far from who I am. I know a lot of women in my industry fight for pay equity amongst their male counterparts, but not against one another. We should be helping one another make more with each other, she continued. So I felt their pain and I will always apologize sincerely from the bottom of my heart if I cause pain on anyone because that is not who I am. But the fat but that felt really far left field for the for, excuse me. But that felt really far left field for me. That felt real out of context and I just don't 
know how to control that. Rodriguez continued telling the host that through her production company, she tries to empower all women. With my production company, that's all I do is try to create that room not limited and definitely not limit to just my community that I associate it with. That's, that, that also includes black Latinos. She said, I feel like people forget that I advocate for all Latinos, not just a reflection of myself. That's the only way to do that as a, as a producer, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, more from this article after this break. Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. And once again, you're listening to Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast. Captain Keith. So if I've hurt you, I'm sorry, and I will always be sorry, but you have to know that until you know my heart, there's no way that we can live off clickbait, you guys. Read, look into somebody who they are, because right now we're living in a culture, a culture that is very, very terrifying. She continued, you make one misstep or one mistake saying something that is out of context and all of a sudden, anything you've ever done is deleted. Any work you've ever done is deleted and that's very difficult. You are allowed to feel pain and I empathize with your pain and I'm sorry if I caused your, your pain because it is the last thing I want to do. And she added, the fact was just told, the fact was just told to let us all say, when we talk about pay equity, we all got to rise together. We got to make sure we, get, we we got each other's back. We don't need to fight each other. And if I cause that notion, please forgive me because that is not my intent at all. So there, 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 there you go. And in more entertainment news, Whoopi Goldberg told Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, sit still for a minute and learn the job. Okay. Whoopi Goldberg wasn't thrilled with the newly sworn rep Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's 60 Minutes interview with Anderson Cooper, with Anderson Cooper that aired Sunday night. The View host had some advice for the young politician over negative remarks of Democratic officials. Goldberg believes Ocasio-Cortez needs to pump the brakes and stop pooping on the shoulders of quite a few giants. Goldberg's fellow co-hosts agreed with her feedback on Ocasio-Cortez's 60 Minutes appearance. She's very opinionated, which we like. We like opinionated women, but it is very, very difficult when people make accusations where you say the Democrats have done nothing. Hmm. Goldberg said, before directing her message at Ocasio-Cortez, I just wanted to throw this out to you. John Lewis wasn't sitting still. Diane Feinstein, Feinstein wasn't sitting still. There are a whole bunch of people in the Democratic Party who have been busting their, their asses to make sure that women get what they need. People get what they need and children get what they need. Goldberg, Goldberg elaborated further, adding, you just got in there and I know you've got lots of good ideas, but I would encourage you to sit still for a minute and learn the job because there are people in that party who have been working their tails off for this country. She continued, I just feel like, you know, you don't have to be born into. You don't have to know it when you step out. But before you start pooping on people and what they've done, you got to do something too. You can't poop on what was you can't poop on what was when you're coming in on the shoulders of quite a few giants. The remarks received thunderous applause from the audience. I mean, and that's true. That is true. But at the same time, you know, there, well, people, people have frustrations. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, it's, it'd be interesting to see the response to what Ms. Goldberg said. But I know one thing, I would definitely um, look into Miss Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for, for myself. Definitely. And in more entertainment news, huh, more sad news here. Comedian Kevin Barnett dead at 32. 
Comedian and writer Kevin Barnett has passed away. The Rail co-creator was 32. Although Barnett's cause of death is not immediately known, his Instagram page shows he was in Mexico just a few days ago. He posted a photo of himself on the street and captioned it in Mexico. Bought myself a sweater, been accused of appropriation several times, and my hat, I just gave a lady some money, so I ain't cold. Either way. Swag. Heavy mixtape coming. 20th Century Fox Television and Fox Entertainment told uh, E! News in a statement, Our hearts are broken as are those of everyone at rail. At the news of Kevin Bryant's passing, he was an incredibly funny, wildly talented man who had so much more to do and so many more stories to tell. We send our thoughts and prayers to his friends and family during this difficult time. Barnett wrote and contributed to a number of television shows and movies, including Broad City, The Carmichael Show, and The Heartbreak Kid. Barnett's most recent show, Rel, premiered just a few months ago in September and stars Get Out actor and comedian Lil Rel, Howery, and Sinbad. He had, few mo he had a few movies in the works as well, including one called The Wrong Missy. Uh, David Spade is so far the only actor attached to it. Many comedians have voiced their sadness and grief on social media about Barnett's death. Brooklyn 999 star Chelsea Peretti retweeted the Stan NYC's post about his passing. I'm so sad, she wrote. Comedy Central also paid tribute to Barnett. Kevin Barnett was an incredible comedian and writer, contributing to Broad City, the stand-up community, stand community, and beyond, the channel, the channel tweeted. He'll be greatly missed. Simpsons and Parks and Recreation producer Mike Scully worked on the Carmichael show too and wrote about Bar Barnett on social media. Kevin Barnett was a great stand up, but I knew him as a smart, funny, talented TV writer and just a really sweet guy who made the insanity of the late nights more fun. He typed condolences to his family and friends. Can't believe I'm writing this comedian and podcast host Ben Kessel or Kissel announced the tragic news on Twitter. Dear last podcast family. It's with heavy heart. We inform you of the passing of Kevin Barnett. He said, the joy he brought to our lives is the greatest gift we have ever received. Remind your friends you love you love them because you never know when you when you'll see them again. We love you, KB. Brooks Wheeling dubbed Barnett the nicest, funniest, meanest, best friend a person could ever hope to have. That's funny. Pete Davidson wrote a statement about Barnett that was posted to his friends Marcus Russell's Marcus Russell Price's Instagram story. Price, also a comedian, said he was effing crushed by the news. The world lost a great one today. One of our comedy family member, one of our comedy family members, Kevin Barnett, has tragically passed. I love Kevin. I've known him for nearly ten years, and he's always been the sweetest and funniest. Davidson note said, "Always had a smile on his face. Was one of the few that treated me like a comic, even when I was just sixteen years old. He always made me feel part of the group." He concluded, "Thank you, Kevin, for being in my life, and blessings, and blessing us with your talents and positive energy. This one really." After me up, you will be missed. Our thoughts go out to the Barnett's loved ones at this time. Young Tony Soprano will be, will be played by James Gandolfini's son. And he looks just like him too in this picture. He looks just like his daddy. Wow. This apple hasn't fallen, hasn't even fallen from the tree. When it was announced that, this, that the Sopranos would be getting a prequel, the reactions were mixed. The show is still adored and talked about years after its ending. We have even made a list of the best episodes this month. And although fans of the beloved show obviously want more Sopranos, prequels often tend towards the disappointing and then cash in. It became more worrying when it was announced that the show would follow a young Tony Soprano who could fill the shoes of the who could fill the shoes of the late James Gandolfini. Not only would it be tough to find a lookalike, but to capture the character that brought him two Emmys and a Golden Globe would be near impossible. Today, they've definitely found a lookalike, Michael Gandolfini, James' son, James's son will play the young Tony Soprano. And the many saints of New York, Gandolfini Jr. told Variety that it's a profound honor to continue my dad's legacy while stepping into the shoes of a young Tony Soprano. Talk about shoes to fill, he continued. I'm, thr I'm thrilled that I'm going to have the opportunity to work with David Chase and the incredible company of talent he has assembled for the many saints of New York. Newark. We shall see. So yeah, he looks just like his dad too. So we'll see what he does. Uh, I will check it out. The Sopranos, the Sopranos was a good show. So the prequels prequels could go either way. So we'll see. But I'll check it out though, definitely. Let's see. And one, 
One second. Where are we? Ice Cube's Friday sequel is well underway. Will Chris Tucker be back? We are witnessing the Ice Cube renaissance. He is currently 49 years old and decades removed from his NWA heyday, but he's got his hands in more things than most of the younger generation could ever dream of. After, after, release, after the release of Shadow Compton movie a few years ago, it seems that he's been re-inspired. He started a proper three-on-three basketball league, long overdue, released a new album called Everything's Corrupt, which I reviewed already today, and now is deep in the writing and casting process to an upcoming sequel to his 1995 classic Friday with Chris Tucker. Where is he now? Cube talked to Zane Lowe on Beats 1 Radio about it, saying that he's currently writing, but also that he's got some more concrete ideas about who will act in it. To me, we got we got great actors in the movie, you know, some comedians, some just great actors. So the movie's going to have the right chemistry. That to me is any, is not it's not anything to worry about. It's more about do they have the material that they can take and turn into magic. It's on me to put that in their hands. Although no release date has been no release date has been set, it seems that the movie is well on its way to completion with Mike Epps apparently on board. So, looking forward to it. Let's see. And in more entertainment news, Justin Bieber praises Chris Brown amid rape accusations. What a day, folks. What a day. Despite recent rape allegations made against Chris Brown, longtime friend Justin Bieber and Nick Cannon are still fans of the singer. Brown was recently arrested and detained temporarily in Paris after a 24-year-old woman accused the singer of raping her in a hotel room last week. He was released without charges and said on Instagram that the allegations were false and that the B was lying. Brown's attorney confirmed to E! News that they are preparing to file a defamation complaint. French police are still investigating the case. On Tuesday night, Brown posted on his Instagram page a video of himself dancing inside a studio. Bieber, a longtime friend of the singer, who has collaborated with him on music, was impressed. No one can touch you. You're the GOAT, Bieber com- uh, commented. Wow. Cannon, who directed and starred with Brown in the 2017 film She Ball, wrote, Stay Focused, King. <sighs> oh. hmm. While Brown received many positive remarks from fans, some users were far from impressed by Bieber's comments. At Justin Bieber, at Justin Bieber, canceled one user commented. At Justin Bieber, delete Justin. Another person wrote, at Justin Bieber, I do not know how the investigation on this case will go. Another person said, but if it turns out to be true, remember that you commented. Ouch. Here's what we'll say here, though. So, Mr. Brown, I get it. You state that it's not true. Understand that completely. But here's the thing. You, when you make a statement that you didn't rape a woman, you don't want to, you know, start off that sentence with that B is lying. Uh, it's not a good look. <laughs> you could just say this lady is lying. But when you say that B is lying, you know, you get the side eye. Just saying. Huh. So we'll see what happens. And it's just important before people start picking sides, just say, hey, we don't know what happened. We'll find out. Short, sweet, and simple. Short, sweet, and simple. Now, Eve goes in on Chris Brown after uh, his rape arrest. She, quote, fix your brain. So, rapper, actress, and now talk show host Eve decided to go to judge, judge, and execution on singer slash dancer Chris Brown. When the panel on the CBS TV show The Talk discussed his recent arrest for alleged aggravated rape and narcotics offenses in Paris, France. This is such a shame. It's it's really a shame, Eve said to her co-host and audience. Obviously, we know he's had troubles in the past. It's like, when are you going to stop and grow up and allow the talent to shine through and fix your brain? This is ridiculous. Eve added that she'd like to hope 
that these allegations aren't true, but she took time to note that the times have changed. If you guys don't know that yet, whether in America or overseas, get your act together, she said. You can't be treating women how you want to treat them in any kind of way just because you think you're a superstar. It's just not the way to be. That's true. Eve went on to say the whole situation makes her sad because Chris Brown is actually a really talented person, adding, I just really hope he gets some help. It's horrible. It's hard. It's a hard thing, she concluded. If you missed the details on Tuesday morning, like I said, it's reported that Brown and two members of his team had been arrested and detained in Paris after a woman told police she had been raped by the R&B singer. The woman says she met Brown at a nightclub between January 15th and 16th before heading back to the the Mandarin Ho Oriental Hotel with him, where she claimed he raped her. The prosecutor's office later told, uh, stated that Brown, one second here, had been released on his own recognizance. without bail, and that he was free to leave France. The other two men were also released. The, invest the investigations which are not closed at this stage, will continue under the authority of the Paris Prosecutor's Office, according to French prosecutors. Meanwhile, Brown insists he's innocent of raping the woman. He even took to Instagram as soon as he was released to share an image that read, This B Lion. He captioned the post, I want to make it perfectly clear in caps, this is false and a whole lot of cap, a whole lot of crap. Never for my daughter and my family, this is so disrespectful and it is against my character and morals. <laughs> okay. You said that, but you started off the sentence by calling her a B. So <laughs> come on, man. Huh. We'll find out what happens. So it's just a, the whole thing is very messy. And in more entertainment news, I know, I know. Let's see. Boots Riley isn't losing sleep over the sorry to bother you Oscar snub. Boots Riley explains the reasons for his blacklisting. Boots Riley has few th has a few theories in check as to why the Academy decided to snub his his ever successful film debut, Sorry to Bother You. As reported, the nominations for the 91st Academy Awards were announced yesterday, and as Boots would have predicted himself, Sorry to Bother You was not among the projects. Shortlisted for any such award, but even in the likeliest of circumstances, Boots was, wants everyone to know the twisted rationale behind the voters' preferences. He made his feelings known in a series of explanatory posts via Twitter. <laughs> Let's see. There are tons of, pe of people making statements this morning about what's sorry to bother you. Not getting on there, it says about the Academy and the film industry that I think are misconceptions that may affect what kinds of movies filmmakers think are possible to get made. So I want to make a few things clear. I think that most of the film industry want to see something new and that there is a large percentage of the film industry that actually agrees with what I'm saying. And sorry to bother you, separate from that. Boots Riley contends that a large percentage of the film industry agrees with the stated message and sorry to bother you amongst the voting base but but Riley also feels that influencer influencers don't want to see movies like sorry to bother you made that's affecting the voting turnout from what from would-be supporters a social phenomenon he calls the spiral of silence theory from my conversations and other um, and from my conversations and other people reporting their knowledge to me there are a lot of people in the academy who like sorry to bother you a lot Obviously, with any movie that takes chances, there are also folks who hated it. That's to be expected. But the largest factor as to why we didn't get nominated is what we didn't actually run a campaign that aimed to get a nomination for a screenplay or song. We didn't buy for your consideration ads in the trade magazines, and excuse me, in the trade magazines, and we didn't service the whole academy with, uh, with screeners. Even so, Riley thinks his film could have received the nomination for its original soundtrack and sound design without influencing the American film landscape for generations to come. But lost, but lost of out, huh. hmm. 
but for but lost out for okay, but lost out for uh, excuse me, but lost out for political reasons. According to Riley, had he purchased your consideration ads in trade magazines or served the voters of the Academy with advanced screenings, sorry to bother you might have wound up nominated in one of the auxiliary category categories. It's nevertheless not at all surprising to see a pure applied communist manifesto miss out on the major plaudits. Boots Rally show Boots Rally should be con excuse me. Boots Rally should be content with the splash he did make with his forcible entry into the film world. It is a great film. It definitely is. Well, good people of the planet Earth and known universe. You've been listening to the GSMC Entertainment Podcast with Captain Keith. Hope you had a good time. I know I did. I uh, I was going to talk about some movie reviews, but I'll do that next week. We'll talk about my review of Glass and my review of Replicas. But until next time, good people of the planet Earth and known universe. Appreciate you all. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, see you somewhere out in space. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.